The, so the first module um, discusses the role of adaptivity in brain-computer interfaces. And so as I indicated in one of the earlier lectures, uh, brain-computer interfaces happen to have um, parameters that are not usually known a priori. They depend on, on a variety of things, as I said. So they depend on where exactly the sensors are. They depend on how the brain is folded for a given person. That determines, in turn, the forward projection, for example. They uh, tend to be sort of different, therefore, across people, across tasks. And in some cases, they depend on things that are not easy to measure directly, such as the functional mapping in the brain. You know, where is function expressed, which requires fMRI and so on. Uh, and in some cases, they are just expensive. So uh, that's a problem. And uh, we need to figure out a way to, to deal with that. And so fundamentally, it amounts to, in general, uh, having some calibration data uh, that allows us to calibrate these parameters um, and some processing step that generates the parameters from the data. And we call the result, which is sort of the, the collection of the parameters, a BCI model. It just represents um, the set of parameters, and you can say also uh, relates to the function of form. Um, of a particular BCI, and these can be things like um, spatial filters and, and other numbers. And so there's different kinds of data that we can stick in there. Uh, one is uh, what we call prior knowledge. So we can have anatomical atlases, for example, which say, well, this kind of function is, say, primarily expressed in this part of the brain or so. Um, uh, or, or this part of the brain is called this and that, um, such as occipital cortex, etc. There's some functional atlases there. Most of them are probabilistic and uh, somewhat blurry. <laughs> they come, say, from fMRI databases and so on. So that's a valid source of information and definitely applicable, although it definitely also requires that whatever you do is sort of somehow properly relating to, to brain space as opposed to sensor space. There's other things that we know, say, about the timing of cognitive processes just from our psychology book. We know, you know, it takes this many milliseconds until the person manages to react or until the person realizes this and that. And we also know things about the spectrum of certain kinds of processes and the frequency spectrum. So we know, say, certain alpha uh, idle rhythms are primarily in 10 hertz band, like we discussed previously. Others are in another frequency band, et cetera, et cetera. So we have all this knowledge. All of this allows us to constrain um, the solution. But then there is another class of data. Um, that is what we call uh, primarily calibration data and example data. So that is actual exemplar EEG um, of a person. Uh, and and in many cases, it is sort of annotated with, um, with useful information that we need to deduce these parameters. And that is a, a very powerful source of information. We'll talk about how to use that. So first and foremost, we need to, however, discuss what properties that data needs to exhibit. So first and foremost, uh, it, it is preferable, although Usually, you can't satisfy all that. It's preferable if that is calculated with the same measurement apparatus as what you actually want to use to run online. So if you run with EEG, you should also record your calibration data with EEG. Otherwise, you have extra uncertainty in how these things relate. Then um, you usually want, if you want to study a particular brain process, how it's expressed in data, usually you need multiple independent realizations of that process uh, th because it might vary. Uh, across realizations that you need to somehow quantify that variability. It's much, much harder if you try to do it from one exemplar, even though it can be done, but that is called one-shot learning. Uh, these things are also called trials in psychology. And then um, if you can somehow control the conditions under which this is recorded, you will want to make sure that they're as close as possible to the actual conditions under which you want to run your brain-computer interface. So same person, same sensor arrangement, Ideally, it's sort of in the same session, so you record and calibrate before you actually use it, but usually that's expensive to do. It takes a lot of time. The same task parameters, so for example, if the actual online use is exciting and interesting, your calibration run shouldn't be 
um, boring as hell <laughs> because then you have a systematic difference between the two things. And so there's a trade-off because in many cases you cannot as, uh, ensure that you have all these things or it's very costly. And um, there's, uh, I, I've talked about this um, multiple relation, realizations part. Um, you can have unlabeled data, which is really just plain EEG and you see, oh, um, there's something happening here and, and there's a lot of noise here or so. That is useful, but what is much, much more useful is so-called labeled data, where you have an example of EEG where the person is, say, under one condition, the person is excited, and you have another chunk of EEG where the person is bored. And then you have multiple realizations of that. Because these are actually directly exa exemplars. They are input-output pairs of your BCI, in a sense. Given this, estimate that um, or predict that. Given this chunk of EEG, predict that. And the task is then just to generalize from these few examples to the whole mapping, basically, to all possible examples. Generalize to future data. Or you could say maybe interpolate between these points in some meaningful way using certain assumptions. Uh, and these assumptions stick somewhere in the functional form. So here's an example of what labeled data looks like. So you have EEG, and you say, here condition A holds. We say just showed an exciting picture and we think the person is excited here. And here we showed a boring picture, and here we showed another exciting picture, assuming that ex um, excitement is just, just a random example here, uh, that it takes this long, uh, you know, after picture presentation until it eventually fades or so. So um, that's, um, these chunks are basically the, the input, and that label would be the output. And so if you design an, um, as, uh, basically an experimental manipulation to, to get the subject into these states, what you end up with is what looks pretty much like a standard psychological type experiment, right? You have multiple realizations, you show certain kinds of stimuli, such as pictures, exciting, non-exciting, and so on. Um, and you, you record the EG and you record the labels in form of certain markers. So that's, very, that's a very well-known discipline and all the various trade-offs I'm not telling anything new here to cognitive scientists or psychologists. Um, so at the end of the day, you have continuous EEG, multiple trials. It's randomized usually to deal with confounds. And you have event markers that indicate um, events. And that is what BCI lab requires is input data and, and most BCI toolboxes and um, implementations. You need that kind of data. That is exemplary data. And you can use the same data to also test offline performance. I'll say a few things about that later. So the, in a sense, a big picture of this whole process is you have some data, um, your calibration data, uh, that could be a recording um, with labeled chunks, or you can have multiple recordings, say multiple people. Uh, you can have auxiliary data like a brain scan and a functional atlas and the sensor measurements, where are my sensors? And all that goes into a function that we call the learning function. And this function needs to somehow integrate all this information and calculate parameters, such as spatial filters. And these parameters are the things that go into, you know, the various slots here in the filter, say what kind of exact spectrum do we want to use, a spectral filter, what kind of spatial filter do we want to use in the prediction function, and so on. So that's sort of the overall information flow in, in a brain-computer interface. You have your pipeline that you apply online, and you have, you have somehow this learning function. And that is um, uh, the, the end of this little intro module.